AI Asia webinar series. My name is Marie and I'm part of WWF Singapore Sustainable Finance Team and I'll be moderating today's session. This webinar will be recorded. The slides, the recording, as well as the links to the material we're going to be discussing today will be provided to you by email. If you have any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A box in the WebEx panel. Before I start by presenting today's speakers and the agenda for the session, I would like to try to know you better. You'll be seeing uh, three questions appear in the poll section of this webinar. The poll will be open for the next five minutes. Thanks a lot for your participation in advance. So today we'll be covering an overview of the SBTI for FI framework. We'll also be detailing the methods for the sector, the finance sector targets, as well as providing you details on the temperature scoring and portfolio coverage tool. We'll also be having Yes Bank uh, present and share on their own experience on the target setting journey. And we will end the session with uh, quick pointers on how to get started on your science-based target journey. We'll also be able to take key questions towards the end of the session. So I do encourage you to note down your questions in the Q&A box you have within the WebEx panel. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's experts. We are having uh, Nate, a senior associate with the World Resources Institute. Within the Science-Based Target Initiative, uh, Nate leads the financial and chemical sector projects. We have Owen from CDP. He is a Science-Based Target Analyst. Uh, he is responsible for conducting and reviewing assessments of corporate emission target reductions. And he also supports with the development of technical guidance tools for the target setting process. We have Donald, who is a sustainable finance manager within WWF. He's also a core member of the Science-Based Target Initiative for Finance team, and he manages the tool development projects for emission targets for bond and equity portfolios. Finally, we have Niranjan, who is head of strategy, sustainability, and investor relations at Yes Bank. So Yes Bank committed to set science-based targets in 2018 and uh, was also providing feedback in the development of the SBTI for FI methodology as a method road tester. Before, I, uh, before we jump into the overview of the SBTI for FI framework, let me give you a few words of introductions on the Science-Based Target Initiative. So the Science-Based Target Initiative was launched back in 2015 with the key target to mobilize the private sector to act urgently on climate-related topics and to uh, make, make science-based target setting practice business standards. Today, over 1,000 companies spanning 60 countries and nearly 60 sectors with a combined market capitalization of over 15 trillion U.S. dollars have committed to set science-based targets. Companies in Asia are also joining this global momentum with over 200 companies in the region having committed to set science-based targets, and this growth has been increasing since 2019. Financial institutions are also part of this movement with 60 financial institutions who have committed to set science-based targets, 10 of which are located in Asia. Before we jump into the rest of the presentation, uh, let me give you an overview of the business case for financial institutions to set science-based targets. Financial institutions play a key role in um, helping us transition toward a low carbon economy. By uh, lending and investing, they have the power to redirect capital towards sustainable solutions and to influence companies to reduce their carbon emissions. By setting science-based targets, financial institutions can also grasp key benefits. The first one being building more resilience and increased competitiveness. When applying the methods to set science-based targets, financial institutions are better prepared and better equipped to identify climate-related risk and opportunities. This also drives them to create more innovation by thinking about future financial products and services which are aligned with a low-carbon world. By setting and achieving science-based targets, financial institutions can also build credibility and reputation 
while preparing for major pol policy shifts and demonstrating leadership. We're now going to jump into the overview of the science-based target framework with Nate. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for everyone for joining today. It's a pleasure to be addressing this audience. So as Mary mentioned, um, I'm with the World Resource Institute and I have been leading this project for the past couple of years. Um, today, I'll just be providing a high level overview of the framework and then passing it to my colleagues to provide more detailed descriptions of the methods and tool that we've developed as part of the framework. So we launched this project um, in 2018, but um, the Science-Based Targets Initiative was actually launched back in 2015. It's a collaboration, as Mary mentioned, of CDP, WWF, WRI, and the UN Global Compact. And um, as part of our broader work to support private sector mitigation ambition, we launched the call to action back in 2015. We actually had a number of uh, financial institutions, 10 financial institutions, commit to setting science-based targets back in 2015 when we first launched this. We've held those financial institutions in abeyance until last month when we finally published this framework, uh, which is the basis for assessing financial institutions' scope three targets covering their investment and lending portfolios. The, um, the framework is something that we've been developing through some close stakeholder engagement. And um, I will now go through and describe some of that process. So it began back in 2018 with the launch of our expert advisory group, uh, which includes um, financial institution staff, academics, and other stakeholders from all over the world. It has uh, more than 30 member individuals. Um, we also began to survey the existing available methods for inclusion in the, um, in the framework. In 2019, we did a road testing process of the methods that were available. We had multiple webinars and expert advisory group meetings. Uh, and then we concluded our method road testing with an in-person workshop in September of 2019 in uh, New York City as part of the Climate Week activities there. That's also when we started the uh, drafting of the criteria for um, financial institutions. This year uh, has been really focused on criteria development process as well as developing the tool um, in order to gather stakeholder feedback on the criteria. We held uh, in-person workshops in London and Tokyo back in February. Um, and uh, then we launched the framework uh, this October, which is starting a six month um, trial pilot phase um, where we are refining the framework and working with the first batch of financial institutions that are actually setting targets to the initiative. So the framework has um, four components. The first is the set of methods that I mentioned that we developed uh, over uh, about a year and a half process, including road testing with a number of financial institutions. The second is a set of criteria that are uh, used by the financial institutions to guide their target development process. The criteria are also used by the Science-Based Targets Initiative to assess target submissions. Um, the third component is a set of tools that we have developed to guide engagement uh, by financial institutions to achieve their targets. And finally, the fourth component is a 170-page guidance document, which encapsulates the first three components, um, but also provides some how-to and some case studies for financial institutions to further illustrate these methods and resources. So um, I'm going to provide a fairly high-level description of the methods and tool um, because my colleagues Owen and Donald will be discussing them in detail. But a uh, brief introduction is to say that um, the, 
The framework includes three methods that we road tested and developed over the past couple of years. The first is a physical intensity approach called the sector decarbonization approach. And then we have these two uh, engagement oriented approaches that are called SPT portfolio coverage and temperature ratings approaches. And um, in the interest of time and uh, deference to, to um, Owen, I will move on. But suffice to say that in this uh, phase of this work, we have consciously narrowed the focus. We're not covering entire portfolios and everything that financial institutions are doing that affects uh, emissions. Um, what we're covering at this point is four asset classes. So it's really real estate, mortgages, electricity generation, project finance, and then this broader group of corporate instruments, which includes equity and debt. And you can see here that we've mapped the particular methods onto these asset classes. So when we'll be discussing this in greater detail as well. The second component of the framework is the criteria. And um, there are more than 20 criteria that we have separately published um, on the project's website. But these specify exactly how the financial institution's target um, has to be configured in order to be clearly and robustly linked with the Paris Agreement, which is the basic um, orientation of the science-based targets initiative. <clears throat> and so the criteria uh, range from the time frame to the uh, scope of the, the targets to um, the recalculation and reporting requirements that are additional for financial institutions. And this goes beyond what we require for companies. So now we have uh, sort of agnostic company criteria that are now in their fourth iteration. And then we have these new financial institution criteria, which are required for financial institutions that are setting targets. The, uh, a key area of the criteria is the uh, coverage requirements. And within this process, we considered um, sector requirements and um, emission materiality or hotspot requirements. Uh, and after deliberation within the initiative and conversation with numerous financial institutions and their stakeholders, we've come to this uh, current table, which is um, our sort of activity-based approach, which breaks out the financial products or activities per asset class and then specifies the coverage requirement for a for a financial institution that's setting a target. So if the financial institution, for example, has corporate long-term loans, then they have to cover um, two-thirds of those uh, in terms of the loan value. And uh, we had feedback from numerous financial institutions that said, well, this is, is quite difficult, especially for their um, short-term revolving credit facilities or their uh, loans to small and medium enterprises. And so you can see here we've made those aspects of corporate lending optional at this point. So this is supposed to focus on the large long-term lending that happens uh, with the financial institution. Likewise, with other asset classes, uh, we've specified exactly what's required for coverage and which methods are applicable for these particular activities. The criteria um, include this detailed table, as well as uh, lots of other um, specifications about the target that, that uh, will meet the SPTI criteria more broadly. The third component is the <coughs> target setting um, tool, which is uh, engagement oriented. And uh, it's an open source tool. And my colleague Donald will be providing um, lots of detailed information on this tool. So I will defer for the discussion for him. Uh, finally, the fourth component is this guidance document that I mentioned. Um, it includes uh, a how-to um, on target setting, but also some broader information in terms of the business case for setting time-space targets, case studies, recommendations on target communication, and um, 
sort of an explanation for the criteria and how they are applied. Um, the case studies that I mentioned are from actual financial institutions that have used our methods. Uh, and so you can see the list of the eight case studies here, um, with uh, Mitsuho being um, our uh, Asian case study where they looked at um, the sector decarbonization approach, that's our physical intensity approach for electricity generation project finance. Um, Wells Fargo, the U.S. bank, uh, looked at PCAF, which is an acronym for Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which is um, a financed emissions method, which is uh, optional for financial institutions to use as an input for the physical intensity approaches here. And uh, can circle back to that if folks have questions. Um, the guidance document also includes uh, information about how these targets can be communicated. And I'd say this is a key uh, service of the SPT initiative is that um, we work with the target setting entities. So now we have, as Mary mentioned, more than 500 companies that have set targets which have met our company criteria. Um, and uh, we've worked with each of those companies to come up with target wording that is then listed on the Science-Based Targets Initiative website. And um, this is uh, how a lot of this information is, uh, is disseminated. And what we find is that once a target is listed on the website, it tends to have uh, a strong influence on peer companies and institutions. And we expect the same dynamic to hold with financial institutions. Finally, um, just stepping back a little bit here, uh, the initiative has been around for five years, uh, and we've been working on this financial sector framework for the past couple of years. Um, but we're very conscious that we do not cover everything, uh, and um, we are one part of a broader spectrum. So. This uh, is a table that we updated within the guidance document that basically breaks the financial sector's journey from high-level commitments to act to measurement of finance emissions, scenario analysis, target setting, enabling action, and reporting um, into those six categories. And you can see we've sort of mapped out different peer initiatives as to which of those six are covered. And you can see the SPT finance uh, framework that we're talking about here today you know, is really obviously focused on target setting, um, but it includes some scenario analysis and uh, enabling action reporting as well. But our goal here with, with this um, webinar and similar outreach activities is to further harmonize this framework with other peer frameworks and initiatives. So I'm very pleased to have all of you joining today. Um, I look forward to discussion and answering questions, and uh, eventually we look forward to having um, many more Asian financial institutions joining the SBT initiative. <clears throat> With that, I will pass uh, to my colleague, Owen, who will be discussing the uh, methods. Thank you, Nais, and good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, as Ned mentioned, I will give an overview of the um, the three kind of core methods that we have developed uh, for our financial institutions to, to set science-based targets. All of these methods have gone through a kind of a consultation process. They have been road tested uh, throughout the, uh, the project. Um, and I'm going to kind of give an overview and some examples today of uh, how they can be uh, used for, for target setting. So first of all, we have our sector decarbonization approach, which is our physical intensity uh, based approach, which is already applied for corporates when they're setting targets. So corporates in certain sectors, particularly the heavy industry sectors, for example, you know, steel, cement, power generation, can use this uh, already existing method to design their own science-based targets. And essentially now this method is also becoming available for our financial institutions who are investing uh, in those sectors uh, that do have these uh, sector-specific pathways available. And then we have these, these two uh, engagement approaches which are built on uh, existing targets that uh, companies have already set, both approved science-based targets uh, in, in the portfolio coverage approach and also then other public greenhouse gas targets that 
uh, companies may have set, uh, and these can be used then by financial institutions to help them uh, to design their own targets. So I will go through each of these three uh, methods um, now in more detail. Um, so first of all, I wanted to kind of give an overview of, of how they're mapped to the various um, asset classes. So as you can see here on, on the, in the left column of the table, we have kind of four major asset classes that we deal with currently um, as part of uh, the first um, uh, criteria and guidance uh, of the FI project. So we have real estate, mortgages, uh, electricity generation, and project finance, and then uh, corporate instruments. And within each of those four asset classes, we have a number of, the, of these methods available that I've, I've talked about. Um, so for example, for real estate, mortgages, um, and kind of project finance, uh, the SDA approach can be used. So this physical intensity approach where we can map uh, investments into these specific asset classes, and they can be tracked with the, uh, the uh, SDA uh, pathway. And then within uh, corporate instruments, then there is the three different approaches can be used depending on the uh, particular uh, company that's being invested in. So, for example, we have the SDA can be used uh, for you know equity or bonds uh, in uh, sectors where we do have uh, a sector pathway. So, for example, if there's investments in uh, the steel sector in companies operating in the steel sector. Uh, companies can use the SDA approach uh, for equity bonds or loans into the companies operating in the steel sector. And then we also have these other two approaches we mentioned, the engagement approaches of portfolio coverage and temperature raising, um, with portfolio coverage you know, centering on uh, companies with already existing uh, SPTs in the portfolio, and then temperature raising focusing on uh, the companies with any public greenhouse gas targets, and we're able to convert those into a temperature and then the target is set ultimately to uh, align that temperature with um, a long-term temperature goal, uh, which we'll go into in a bit more detail. So I'd like to start with just an overview of the of the SDA. So the sector decarbonization approach is a, is a sector-based approach um, and it's built on the International Energy Agency's uh, ETP, so the Energy Technology Perspectives, which is a kind of a report published um, uh, each year by the IEA, which gives an overview and defines a sector-specific carbon budget uh, for various sectors based on uh, mitigation technology options and providing kind of activity projections. Um, so the SDA is based on, on, on the IEA data and it follows a convergence approach, uh, whereas the carbon intensity of all companies um, in that sector is expected to converge uh, towards the same rate. Um, and it also takes into consideration the initial carbon intensity uh, of the company and indeed its relative growth. So we have public tools available um, where uh, companies can essentially you know, uh, put in their uh, initial carbon intensities, they can set different various growth rates that they may have, and through that they can um, define their own science-based target that will work within uh, this uh, sector uh, carbon budget. And as I mentioned, we have this available for, for many sectors. This is just an example for the, the real estate sector. Um, so if a financial institution has um, in investments in the real estate sector, it can use this SDA approach. Um, and essentially, the financial institution is aligning uh, its real estate mortgage portfolios um, with the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. So these are the kind of the, the well below two degree uh, pathways that are set out. And in principle, then, the, the target is defined around where the emissions intensity, so that is the, the kilograms of CO2 per square meter of real estate, um, and they align this intensity with these global pathways. You can see in the chart here, there's these, uh, these different pathways and examples of both the two degree and the well below two degree pathway for both uh, residential and uh, service buildings. And essentially then the financial institution is committing to align yeah, the, the initial intensity that they currently have with these pathways um, out to uh, 2050. And the potential target output, an example here would be that the financial institution commits to reduce its mortgage or real estate portfolio greenhouse gas emissions by a certain percentage per square meter by 2030 from a 2019 base year. That's just an example of a typical target that could be produced. So it's a physical intensity, intensity-based um, target that they can set, um, in this case, for example, for, for real estate. Um, we also have a similar example here for electricity generation. 
it's the, the same principle where uh, instead of uh, per square meters in this case, you'll be looking at the output from the uh, power generation sector, which is a kilowatt hour or a megawatt hour. So companies in this uh, in this case can can set targets based on their investments in uh, the uh, electricity generation sector, um, where the financial institution will be committing to reduce the electricity generation project finance emissions X percentage per kilowatt hour uh, by a certain target year from a certain base year. Um, and the same principle can be applied then for all of the sectors that we have um, pathways for, um, and their detail in the next slide. As you can see here, the proposal is available for power generation, cement, transport, aluminium, buildings and real estate, uh, iron and steel, uh, pulp and paper. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the intensity-based approach can be used for any of these sectors. Um, we do have publicly available tools online, so we have the existing uh, tools that we have for corporates in this space, uh, and these tools can be used um, by financial institutions to help them to also set targets. Um, using these online tools, you simply will upload the relevant data, which is the you know the current emissions, the current activity. So that could be, in the case of power generation, would be the the current uh, kilowatt hours produced by a certain company, um, or in the case of real estate, the the floor area, the square meters of of um, of the portfolio uh, of the real estate company. Um, and indeed, then you would also, you need to add in the activity projection. So how you expect the um, the company's activity to change over time. So how do you expect the output to change uh, or their portfolio uh, floor area, for example, to change. And once you uh, upload this information into these tools, uh, the tool will essentially generate the minimum required target uh, for certain temperature goals. So we have 1.5 degree and well below pathways available for the, the power generation sector. And then we have um, well below two degree pathways available for all the other sectors as well. Um, in addition to this, we have now a specific tool available designed for the SPTI FI project, um, which is uh, solely designed for real estate and mortgage investments. So this is also a very useful resource uh, that can be used. Uh, it's also publicly available, um, and, and the links are here uh, in these slides. So I now want to shift to the uh, the first of our two uh, engagement approaches, um, and this is our kind of science-based targets portfolio coverage uh, method. Um, and essentially, this method is where the financial institutions cover a minimum percentage of their investees. These are the companies that they're investing in uh, with their own science-based targets. Uh, it's a financial sector analog to what we already have existing in the corporate space for supplier engagement targets, where corporates will commit to engage uh, a number of their suppliers to set SPTs, whereas in this case we're asking financial institutions to commit to engage their investees to set their own uh, science-based targets. And the kind of out potential target output we're looking for here is where an investment firm or a financial institution commits that you know, X percentage of their equity portfolio uh, by, say, market cap will have their own science-based targets by uh, 2024. And how do we kind of know which companies have these science-based targets? So currently on the corporate side, we have um, just over 500 uh, corporates globally with approved science-based targets. And these are updated weekly on the SPTI website, and you can download the latest um, lists of companies. We have the the the, the company name, the the ISIN to be able to help search for them, and also their temperature classifications in the sectors and so on. And essentially, the the method works, um, uh, and and the ambition is defined based on a linear projection of 100% of the portfolio coverage uh, by 2040. So essentially, with this method, we want uh, all investees in a certain portfolio to have science-based targets by uh, 2040. Um, and we have a number of different weighting approaches which, um, which are available in our SPTI finance tool, which Donald will uh, describe in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but essentially, we have this linear path out to 2040. So kind of a, just a quick example of how this actually works in practice. Um, for example, if you have a financial institution and their portfolio has 10% coverage in 2020 
of, uh, of, the, of their investees with science-based targets. This means that 10% of the companies or the market cap of those companies or the emissions of those companies already have uh, science-based targets. And what we do then to look at what is the pathway, we will take the remaining uh, X percentage to get them to 100. So that in this case, they will need to increase that by 90% to, to get to 100% coverage by 2040. And they would need to do that over the next 20 years. So this is by 2040, which is the, the, the ultimate target here to reach 100%. Um, and this means that they will essentially have to increase coverage by 4.5% per year. Um, that is the minimum required coverage uh, for any valid target. And then effectively, if they wanted to have, for example, a target by 2025, this would uh, ultimately mean they'd need 32.5% coverage by 2025. So that would mean they would have to go from 10% in 2020 up to 32.5% in 2025 coverage to ultimately reach 100% coverage uh, by 2040. So this is this is the, the current approach. Also to say that um, while it does seem now that 500 companies is not a, a major number when we look at the investable universe, but uh, this number is increasing um, at quite a significant rate. So science-based targets on the corporate side uh, is very much becoming standard business practice. We have many companies joining the initiative every week uh, with new targets being published. Uh, so we've just surpassed um, 500 companies uh, this week, um, and we expect that to continue growing at a fast rate, um, which will hopefully make this also approach more attractive to, company, to financial institutions to know that the companies that they're investing in are actually starting to, um, to follow this approach and set their own uh, science-based targets. And I want to kind of move on now to the final method, which is our, our temperature raising. Um, and essentially, the temperature raising is kind of an extension of the portfolio coverage method. Um, so as I mentioned, what we currently have with the with SBTs is we have defined uh, you know, three long-term temperature goals. So companies can have their SBTs that are two degrees well below or 1.5 degree classified. But it's a very limited number of companies, as I mentioned. So we have 500 companies globally, but this is only a small fraction of all of the public greenhouse gas targets that currently exist. Um, so what the temperature rating method does is it extends the analysis from the, the public SBTs to all available public uh, greenhouse gas targets. And then we essentially then translate uh, those targets into a temperature rating. And this temperature rating then can be used uh, by a financial institution to set um, a science-based target. And the goal of the approach is to be able to convert you know, any public greenhouse gas target into a temperature rating, and that can then be used um, for their own SBT. So, so, so financial institutions do not simply have to rely on only the SBT, but they can look at a much broader range of targets and hence a much broader range of, of investee companies. And there's, there's kind of three core steps to the method. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially what we do is we, we take um, the publicly available targets and we take the ambition of those targets and we convert them uh, into a temperature rating based on the IPCC uh, special report uh, scenario set. So we have scenarios uh, and models available for all different types of targets from all different types of sectors. So this includes intensity targets, absolute targets, um, and, and what we can do then is we can take any kind of public formulation, and this might be a percentage reduction per square meter or a, a absolute percentage reduction, um, and we can convert that uh, into a temperature. Um, the second step of the method then is where we aggregate um, the, the various uh, company targets. So a company may have many different types of targets across different time frames and different scopes. And we aggregate that uh, to produce uh, an overall temperature rating at the company level. We also have a default scoring method here. So if companies do not have targets, we are still able to provide them with a temperature rating. So this allows us to actually achieve this 100% coverage um, because we can essentially give this rating to all companies, even if they do not have uh, a public valid target. And then the final step is where we have a number of different weighting approaches to produce um, a temperature rating at the portfolio level. So we take the individual temperature scores of the companies, 
we weight them uh, using one of our weighting approaches and then we're able to generate an overall result at the portfolio level. And Donald will describe a little bit more detail how uh, we, we can use the SBTI tool to essentially achieve this uh, once you input uh, the, uh, the, the target and the greenhouse gas data of those investee companies. And finally, I want to kind of conclude with just an overview of, of what this actually looks like. Again, similar to the um, portfolio coverage method, our, our long-term target year is 2040. And in this case, we uh, we require the company or the financial institution set um, at least well below two degree aligned targets for their scope one and two, and at least two degree aligned targets for their scope one plus two plus three um, of the of the portfolio. And similarly, we have this linear pathway to 2040. So, for example, if a company has an existing temperature score of 2.9 degrees in 2020. Um, what we look for then is what would they have to the remaining temperature reductions they need over the 20 year period from 2020 to 2040 and in this case that would be 0 0.057 degrees Celsius uh, each year is the minimum they would have to uh, reduce by to stay in line uh, to achieve this well below two degree rating by 2040 and then companies can use this approach to essentially define what would their temperature rating of the portfolio need to be at each given year uh, for them to set their targets. And then just to find it, you can kind of include an example of what this looks like in practice. So we have Amundi, which is one of the case studies detailed in our guidance document. They're one of the first financial institutions to uh, test this approach, and they did it for four of their funds. So they were able to take the greenhouse gas and the target data um, of the investee companies. They had coverage of around between 35 and 65 percent. Um, and within that, then, they're able to calculate the temperature ratings for companies with targets and also use the default scoring approach for companies without targets. And as you can see here, they define the temperature rating for a number of their funds between about 2.3 and 2.7 degrees Celsius. And this then is essentially the starting point for them to set their targets. They have their current base year temperature rating. And then with the tool uh, that Donald will outline, they're able to then essentially highlight what kind of a, a, temp, a target they would need over various different time frames. Yeah, and with that, I'll, I'll hand you over to, uh, to Donald to detail more on the, uh, the tool and actually putting these methods into practice. Thank you, Owen. Um, so you have control? Yes, I do. Good. Um, so my name is Donald Indrudes. I work with uh, WWF, um, and I've been working on uh, this uh, methodology or and or the tool. Uh, let's see if I can move the slides here as well. Good. So um, I'm going to take it through the uh, primarily through the uh, temperature scoring and portfolio coverage tool, but I also want to mention as um, I just want to show that we that we do have other tools available, um, but those have been in, in the wild, so to speak, for a little while. Uh, so, and um, Owen went through um, a few of the methodologies or the methodology around the SDA um, a little bit earlier, so I won't go into that too much. Uh, but this is one of the one of the tools for the SDA approach, the residential mortgages and commercial real estate tool, uh, for example. So let's dive into the uh, the SPTI finance tool for temperature scoring and portfolio coverage. And when we set out this project to do this, uh, we set up a, a number of objectives um, uh, that we wanted to um, to achieve. We wanted it to be a, an open source solution uh, so that we can ensure continuous development. We want it to be widely distributed. Uh, we want it to be transparent and we wanted it to be data agnostic so that you can use any data provider uh, or indeed your own data lake uh, with your own data, obviously. We also wanted it to be um, uh, able to interface with any user interface that you might have out there. May that be sort of your homegrown portfolio management solutions or a Bloomberg terminal or MCI or whatever that might be. Um, but first and foremost, we wanted this to be a workflow tool. 
for portfolio managers and CIOs, for ESG and financial analysts, uh, for risk management and compliance. The reason we wanted it to be that is that this is not a compliance tool. This is not something that you pick out of the bottom of the compliance desk drawer uh, once every year or once every six months in order to fill, a, fill out some report. This is a tool that you can actually use in your daily um, portfolio management activities to make sure that your um, that your portfolio and your assets follow uh, uh, the targets that you set out. So in order to do that, we uh, put together a development team for this, obviously comprising of the science-based targets with uh, the three um, sort of main um, uh, organizations uh, within that, within the uh, finance arm, uh, WWF, CDP, and, and WRI. Um, and we put out a um, an RFP to uh, get some help with actually writing the code for this tool. And uh, after a, a process, um, we ended up with going with Autic Finance and OS Climate, who helped us to actually um, develop this tool. And um, to uh, be able to integrate this into any data source and to any user environment, we also needed naturally to uh, get a good understanding for um, how, what that data looked like and what those user environments would look like as well. So we invited a number of data and service providers um, uh, to the project team. So we've been working with them uh, at least on a weekly basis in our in our weekly team meeting, but uh, very often much more frequently than that. So these are Bloomberg, CDP, Nastrally, ISS, uh, MSCI, TrueCost, uh, Standard Poor's, TrueCost, and then Urgentum. Um, and they've been very helpful in both sort of uh, testing tools, but also to make sure that we develop something that can actually integrate with our data uh, and with our uh, with our user interface. Um, and finally, we um, also um, brought on users from the Net Zero Asset Donor Alliance, and we had a, a couple of those um, organizations there, Al uh, Alliance and, um, and Storybrand who also gave us the view from the user perspective to make sure that we actually develop something that they can actually go on and use in their, um, in their uh, daily work. So uh, the tool is, uh, if you want to be a little bit mean, it's a, it's a, it's a calculator, um, so to speak, and it doesn't include any data, and it doesn't really um, sort of provide um, it, it provides output, but it doesn't really have a user interface to provide that output. But that's not quite true. Um, well, we'll come on to that in, the, uh, in a minute. So what we have developed is what you see on the screen here in the middle, uh, which takes the input data from the left uh, from um, pretty much any data source. Um, that includes the data that, that Owen was talking about, uh, sort of the, the ambition of the target, the time frame, scope, and coverage, and so on, but also um, corporate data, such as uh, current emissions uh, and financial data, sector um, uh, data, and so on. And then we take that and we convert the temperature um, uh, ambition, the, <clears throat> the target ambition, into the temperature score, we aggregate that to portfolio and sector and market level, um, and we let you then measure uh, your portfolio's alignment with the, with the Paris Agreement. And through that process, we also give you the tools in order to sort of set the emissions target. We're going to go on uh, to show a uh, an example of this in a moment. But as I said, I mean the the, the as we want to be able to integrate with as many different user interfaces as, as possible. We haven't really devised sort of, um, sort of dashboards and things like that for you to use, but that is actually we're shipping the data out to um, often where the data come, <laughs> the results we, we ship them out to often where the data came, came from. So maybe your Bloomberg terminal or your MCI interface, 
um, and uh, presenting the tool, and they present the the, the results of, of of that calculation for you. Um, and this is so that all the users that we uh, described earlier can actually uh, make use of this um, uh, solution to submit targets to the SPTI um, and to, for example, um, comply with regulation. Uh, but also, as I said, use this maybe not on a daily basis, but weekly, monthly, quarterly basis to make sure that your portfolio is in line with the Paris Agreement. And also to uh, obviously uncover risks in your portfolio and opportunities in your portfolio uh, stemming from, um, uh, from, from, uh, from climate change. So um, uh, the finance tool just is essentially just a, um, a slide to uh, provide you with some, some links in here, uh, but it is a, a solution available via um, Python. It's a, it's a Python uh, a tool uh, or Python library, uh, but you also have an API uh, link into um, into that tool, so uh, that you can integrate it into other solutions as well. Uh, we're going to go through this analysis workflow example in a, in, a, in a second. So, what can you actually use this tool for? Well, uh, you can use it for um, portfolio manager. You can obviously look into sort of companies and sectors and see how much they are contributing to climate change uh, uh, to measure a, a portfolio temperature score, um, uh, make sort of strategic and allocation decisions, security selection decisions, um, analyze changes in your, uh, in your portfolio, um, and more importantly, model impact of engagement, because this is an engagement tool. And we're going to see how that works in a, a, in a minute. And with that, you can then plan engagement strategies based on your modeling to make sure that you can follow that linear path of temperature reduction that we was talking about. Um, so what data do you need for the tool? Well, you obviously need portfolio data. You need financials and emissions data, which we talked about. This, is, this should be a sort of standard uh, issue these days. Uh, the additional data that you need for this is emission reduction targets. Um, and uh, it says 470 here, but it's uh, past 500 now that uh, Om is talking about. It's obviously available on our website, but it's also available from um, many of these data providers that we have been working with and, and others, uh, we should mention. Uh, and then in in addition to that, there is about 4,000 publicly disclosed targets as well that we can actually use uh, for this tool. So from an ESG perspective, the coverage and the universe that you can actually use this tool for is um, it's, it's not bad uh, at all, considering where we have sort of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, reported greenhouse gas emissions data, for example. So the analysis process, um, Owen went through that uh, a little bit. This is just schematic um, of that, that we convert targets to temperature scores. We then, uh, so we, and then we generate a, a company level temperature score. As many uh, companies do have multiple targets. Uh, so we aggregate them up uh, on a company level, and then we aggregate those companies' targets up to portfolio level. Um, to get the current state of your portfolio, and then you can run this tool uh, and use scenario analysis solutions uh, within the tool um, in, in order to uh, see what you need to do in order to uh, reach a, a target uh, if you're not already there already. Uh, this is essentially the same thing, uh, just with a little bit more detail around that. Have a look at that um, later when we send out the slides. So uh, let's jump into an analysis example. So we do, uh, from this tool, we get, and this is taken from this uh, Jupyter notebook um, um, based on, Python, on the Python code. Um, so uh, the tool generates a company temperature score, as I, as I said, and we actually get sort of a, a matrix of, of six, or actually nine, as you get also scope one, two, and three. Um, uh, temperature score uh, for the company, 
and for a short, medium, and long-term um, uh, target. And then we take that and we generate and we aggregate that up, and we have I think seven different aggregation methods. Uh, so some of those are are based on, or most of those are based on some sort of inclusion of of um, uh, current emissions, uh, but they um, also based on uh, things like uh, revenue. Uh, we use uh, total assets. We use uh, market cap or enterprise value as um, denominators uh, in order to aggregate these um, into a portfolio temperature score. And as we can see here, we can divide this how we, what type of data we want to get out of this. But in this case, we're seeing the midterm um, scope one, two, and scope one, two, and three. They come out at 2.6 and uh, 2.9 degrees, let's say. And we also then get the portfolio coverage, uh, which is obviously the other methodology in, the, in this tool. And we see that that is coming out at 35%. I must say that any data that are presented here is totally random data, so there's nothing to do with, with the real world. Uh, so don't get hung up on, on whether the numbers actually make any sense at all. Um, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So with that data, uh, many solutions may actually in there and say, okay, fine, uh, then we know what the current state is, and obviously we need to reduce this down to uh, well below two, so 2.7, sorry, 1.75 degrees, for example. Uh, so we have, what, 0.9 degrees left to go, so that would mean X over a, a number of years. So, um, uh, but we wanted to help to to be able to uh, device your and your engagement strategy do that. So therefore, we developed a number of, of solutions for that. First, we can anal analyze the uh, portfolio on a heat map or sectorial basis, and we can, for example, see here that the Asian industrials is a standout compared to European and North American industrials. And we can see if we're looking at this portfolio on a global level that energy is obviously um, is scoring quite high, uh, which is a bad thing in this case. And but more importantly, why is communication services uh, so high as well, uh, similar to energy? Um, and we can then look into the actual holdings of the portfolio, and we can. Uh, sort of see how much each individual company within a sector or for the portfolio as a whole contributing to the overall temperature score. And uh, if we want to devise a sort of an engagement strategy, so probably quite important to understand how much impact can we actually have uh, when we want to engage with these companies. And obviously, if you own quite a big chunk of, of that company, your uh, success rate may be a little bit higher than if you have a, a small sliver of their um, equity share, for example. So in this case, we have company Q and company AM. We own around 5% and 12% respectively. They contribute quite a bit. They're high up on the ranking and contribution in terms of our temperature score. So we say, okay, what if we um, engage with these companies and at least initially um, convince them to set a at least a two degree target. So let's run that through the scenario analysis uh, tool and see what that actually does to, to the portfolio. Uh, and that's what we have here, right? So we uh, we've run this scenario through the, um, through the through the tool. And this is obviously going to be presented in some other way for, for you, but this is what this uh, Jupyter notebook that you can go on and, and have a look at um, uh, just after this uh, webinar uh, actually looks like and, and uh, what it presents. Um, so we have the actual, which we saw before on the midterm, one is going one and two, uh, coming out at 2.6. And after we run our scenarios, just changing those two companies out of a 50 company portfolio in this case, uh, the overall temperature score comes out at 2.46. So maybe that, uh, if we're looking at that, that may be enough for, for us uh, for the next year. 
or so. So maybe that's a, a it's a good step in the right direction. Um, but we probably need to do a lot more. But at least you you know roughly where your path is, and you can sort of benchmark that against where you need to be. Uh, we can also drill into this and see on a sector level here, and as we can see, the energy and the communication services sector have dropped quite significantly due to our uh, engagement in these in these companies. So naturally, the results of this is that we need to have more ambitious engagement and obviously over a longer period of time in order to shift all the companies in our portfolio. Um, but uh, the solution here is obviously to use this tool in order to model uh, uh, various scenarios uh, to, uh, to to do that. And um, when you've uh, sort of devised a, a strategy that you're that you're happy with, and you say, okay, we can actually reach a 1.75 degree or a 1.5 degree target in a reasonable amount of time. And therefore, we are uh, going to set a target. So this is our strategy. Uh, uh, we have a reporting solution here as well, where you essentially output uh, the uh, most essential parts of, of, of your portfolio and showing what kind of aggregation methods and what default scores. We won't go into that uh, right now, but we can talk about that uh, offline later. Uh, and what your portfolio coverage for the portfolio is and what your um, temperature score for the portfolio is as well. Uh, and all of this data is anonymized, so you can ship that over to us and say, hey, here's our portfolio, have a look at that. Um, uh, this, is our, this is our target, and we run that through our target validation process, and um, hopefully we can um, approve your target after that. So as you can see, the, uh, the SPTI finance tool uh, for temperature scoring and portfolio coverage is providing analysis and modeling and reporting uh, to make sure that you can sort of uh, measure your alignment and set your targets and devise your uh, engagement strategies um, uh, to achieve the, the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, obviously, and, and reduce the uh, climate impact of your investment portfolios. So where do you start? Well, as I said initially here, we have worked with a number of companies um, in order to um, make sure that this tool is, is uh, that you can actually use this tool in, in, in the wild. Uh, we didn't want it to be something that you um, needed to uh, sort of Dig out all the data yourself, and and, um, uh, and sort of upload something to some website somewhere. This is obviously your portfolio data. Uh, we know that financial institutions can't sort of just ship around their portfolio data uh, to um, websites um, for security reasons, naturally. But uh, so you can engage with pretty much any of these companies that have have been involved in this development. Uh, process, uh, CDP, Bloomberg, ISS, MSCI, TrueCost, uh, and Urgentum, um, to get data and or tools, ready-made solutions in order to actually run this. Or you can naturally take the open source uh, uh, Python code and integrate it into your own homegrown portfolio management uh, solutions. Uh, the first thing that I would encourage you to do, though, is to go to this Google Colab interactive analysis workflow example that I talked about before, and that you saw some snippets from, uh, so that you can get a good understanding for both. Uh, we'll go through uh, both the methodology and the um, uh, and uh, both the methodology and the uh, and the code, uh, obviously. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to our uh, to YesBank uh, for the next uh, presentation. Thank you, Donald. We're now going to start the sharing session with YesBank, so I'm inviting uh, Niranjan to come and join. Hi, Niranjan. 
Thanks again for participating in this sharing session. So as I mentioned previously in the introduction, Yes Bank has committed to set science-based targets in 2018 and has also been providing feedback in the development of the SCI for FI methodology as a method road tester. So my first question would be around the drivers that led Yes Bank to make such a commitment and the key business benefits you see for a financial institution such as yours to set science-based targets. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and uh, a very good afternoon uh, to be here for this talk. Um, it will be a pleasure to be here today, and uh, thank you for inviting us back. So this is back to a uh, also, before I get into the uh, question, I also wanted to congratulate uh, at the PWF, uh, CDP, uh, WRI, and UNGC uh, for convening this discussion and, and also being the central force in, in mobilizing action by developing a, a very progressive uh, action level agenda to the uh, So, the question uh, if, if you were to if you were to hold these discussions uh, five, seven, eight years back, uh, you know, many would have thought that climate change, ESG, as a big concept, uh, as linkages with the, the investment and the financial community uh, were not our expectation. Uh, but now we are, we are seeing more of those conversations uh, with governments, uh, private sector, that there is a realization that adverse effects of climate change actually threaten uh, financial stability, and uh, there is a, a lot of actions that have been taken. So, the research by uh, international bodies like uh, you know, the IPCC, um, uh, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the International Energy Agency, uh, the Network of Greening the Financial System, you know, have all established that micro financial impact of, of climate risk is actually expanding. Um, there is strong legislation that is also emerging. Uh, focus on, on ESG, like the European Union Action Plan, uh, by UK, Japan, um, you know, all encouraging enhanced uh, disclosures. Uh, we've also seen regulators like uh, Bank of England, the ECB, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, HKMA are all issuing um, you know, guidelines for banks to incorporate climate risk practices. And, you know, if you just globally see 3,000 signatories uh, of the principles for responsible investment with over 90 trillion in, in uh, assets under management. They're all committed to integrate sustainability in their uh, investment decisions. And, and the world's largest investment have, have formed the net zero asset over land that's committed to carbon neutrality by, by 2050. Now, the reason for highlighting these uh, developments is to bring forth the point that regulation and policy on climate are inevitable. And, and since the global financial system is so interconnected, uh, India is likely to see the ripple effects um, in, in terms of its own regulation, similar to that of uh, the various other countries, including the EU. And, and, and given that India is also specifically vulnerable to climate change, uh, the Indian financial sector, insurance, banking, asset managers, and, and asset owners, uh, like to specifically take uh, climate risk and opportunities uh, into account. Uh, this concept has also been this kind of picked up momentum with the Indian Prime Minister reinforcing focus on, on the issue of delivering uh, constant growth. And so, yes, Bank, in, in a similar stride, believes in in mainstream sustainability uh, with its own business strategy. And the bank has been driving sustainable finance agenda globally by by being uh, the founding member uh, and secretary to the U.S. Institute for Responsible Banking, a supporter of, of DCFP, and, and also has take, undertaken uh, specific targets on, on mobilizing sustainable finance uh, in India. And, and therefore, uh, you know, just to therefore respond to the specific question that you asked, adoption of uh, in the science of those targets actually just provides a logical and, and, and unified approach uh, to, to outline our future strategy, targets, focus sectors, and, and uh, also ensure the these uh, Thank you, Niranjan. I think we're having a little bit of a network connection issues. So I think it would be preferable just for the following questions in this interview, 
could uh, switch off your video. I think it might help a little bit uh, with the bandwidth. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, yeah, I guess I get. I hope it'll be better just now. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot for for making this detailed description of your sustainability and climate strategy and how the SBTs fit into all that. And as for any uh, key transversal strategic program, securing internal commitment and engagement is a key success factor. Could you detail a little bit more about being able to secure this internal commitment and establish a clear governance structure even within the top levels of your organization? So that's a little actually uh, I would say one of the most important questions I would say that, that comes in is to how do you ensure that uh, you mainstream uh, some of these objectives which are which have still not evolved in a manner um, uh, uh, that, that the, let's say, that the commercial mindset kind of starts to evolve. Uh, the good part is, let's say, when we look at responsible banking, it's actually been one of our strategic pillars and, and in one of our differentiators right from uh, right from inception. So we had a separate vertical of responsible banking right from day one. Uh, uh, what we've also done is, um, if you if you see, uh, if you have to mainstream sustainability and and climate. Uh, climate risk, uh, we have actually now got sustainability, strategy, and investor relations all integrated into a single team, which you know I think is is critical for, for uh, driving the mainstream of agenda. Um, so this this unit is uh, which which I which I oversee. We we are involved in both developing, implementing back wide sustainability and climate strategy. Uh, with the eventual aim of integrating it with our core businesses from both risk uh, and, and opportunities and point. In fact, climate risk, what we have also been able to do is to uh, introduce climate risk as a critical risk in the bank's uh, ICAP, uh, which is which is uh, internal capital adequacy assessment process, uh, wherein we have we have flagged this as a as an important element that the bank should be looking at, and you know this is important because this all of this eventually also leads into uh, the management as well as the board taking note of it and, and therefore devising strategies to also mitigate these risks. Um, just at a at a structure level, um, what we have what we have done is um, uh, we've strengthened the governance structure at the at the management level. Uh, so when I say strengthen, it's essentially that the scope of the management committees has been widened to to have an executive level sustainability council, and and this council is chaired by the uh, and the CEO, uh, and, and this council is responsible for developing reviewing strategy towards ensuring sustainable development to uh, to the bank's activities, uh, also implementing the climate strategy, and also uh, most importantly. Uh, oversight of the critical initiatives like the uh, SPTI targets. Um, we also have various other committees where uh, not solely, but some of these risks do get <coughs> dovetailed into their discussions. So, for example, uh, the risk monitoring committee of the back of the board. Uh, there is an enterprise risk and a reputation risk committee uh, at the management level, uh, and also <coughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the CSR or the corporate social responsibility. And, and clearly, you know, all of these mean <clears throat> that sustainability is is a constant focus. Uh, what we also do is that the, the intent and the idea is is to have a continuous internal engagement with the business units uh, to not only uh, highlight the the importance of of ESG and climate, uh, you know, climate compliance scenario, but more importantly, also how can this help the the businesses to to do better, uh, uh, you know, because we are identifying risk for them. We are effectively reducing that their cost. We are providing them avenues for uh, better growth. So I think the the moment uh, you know some of these aspects are looked beyond just a compliance and you know, this is like a necessary do, but more of business enabler. That is where we find uh, uh, you know, that there is more acceptance. Uh, uh, until and unless you know there are regulatory frameworks that come in and, and make some of this better. Thanks a lot on that, and it, it's it's really interesting to see how you've um, articulated 
as a business enabler rather than compliance. So now that we have a better understanding of your strategy and governance on climate-related issues such as the science-based targets, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the challenges you may have encountered. And we often hear that emission data gathering, and we've seen a couple of questions on this topic in the Q&A, is, is considered as daunting. So I was wondering how uh, Yes Bank has tackled data management and the process we went through to overcome this challenge. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, if, I, if I were to just respond, at first I would say data availability will not necessarily be a challenge. I think it's the right usage that actually needs uh, the, the attention, right? And I, I think the regulatory landscape is evolving uh, in India, which will eventually address, I would say, the, the challenge of uh, capturing data. So, you know, the way the way to mainstream this, because I think at the core, the mainstream becomes a critical element for us, right? And as I mentioned earlier, business, how do you kind of make this a business enabler? So the question is, if you, in your <coughs> credit decisioning, if you start putting in place uh, covenants that that necessitate um, a data formation practice on the borrower end, uh, uh, we, we were actually surprised to see that companies do provide that information. It's just that uh, there has to be a push, uh, I, there has to be um, uh, a logical explanation to, uh, to solve these things. So, uh, just to give an example, we've, we've gone out to corporates and also um, <clears throat> businesses and, and actually communicated the benefits that the, the borrower uh, you know, derives from being a more climate compliant uh, uh, climate compliant entity. So, I, I think it's how how you kind of uh, you know pick up this subject uh, and introduce uh, you know various aspects into the day-to-day uh, -day process. Um, <clears throat> there is, however, having said that, uh, it's, it, it, I would say there is a solution, but clearly we do get uh, uh, we do get handicaps for data. Um, so most projects uh, projects that get financed, they we find it difficult to get the uh, the actual GHG emissions on a theoretical basis. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to, 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 to kind of uh, make that more regular. Um, when the data is available, um, uh, a lot of times, instead of looking at, um, we use actual proxies from the Central Electricity Authority, uh, you know, to estimate the GHG uh, emissions. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've put in place these processes through a centralized team, which is the Fed Administration Department, uh, that maintains the consolidated list of all the projects, the data that we get. Uh, I would say the data collation is improving, but um, there is uh, a reasonable way to go before I can say, uh, you know, that, that it will be uh, it will be easy to compute uh, the emissions of the Thank you, Niranjan. I think you were fading off a little bit towards the end, but if I can recap in a few words. So you were mentioning that it's also important for you to work with clients in order to uh, obtain this data and when uh, not available, also make use of proxies. So um, it, it's really interesting that you mentioned the need to actually engage the clients you're lending to in order to uh, augment the access to data uh, through the various of our experts today, we understand that financial institutions, in order for them to set and achieve science-based targets, need to engage the companies uh, they lend to and invest in. And we often hear that Asian companies uh, still need to make progress on disclosing climate-related emissions uh, data and also uh, climate-related risks and opportunities. Do you feel like this lack of disclosure today will impact your own target setting journey? And if so, um, can you give us maybe your view on how you're engaging these companies today to align their own business models? So my mind, uh, interaction with uh, uh, investing companies on, on ESG climate requires collaboration. So that uh, the borrowers see the merit and derive value and not, not consider as an obligation to access finance. And, and in the Indian context, uh, promoting greater understanding uh, is, is actually becoming, is, is becoming very important. Uh, of course, 
So uh, is it globally? Uh, but I think in the Indian context, there is a lot more room to cover. Um, so what have we done at at the bank? So we've we've instituted um, an environmental and social framework to to manage the ESG uh, uh, and climate impact around, arising out of the project uh, transactions. And uh, this framework serves as an effective control to measure against potential risk uh, on the portfolio, on the project. Um, we also have uh, periodic environmental and social due diligence of, this, of these companies, uh, and, and in, in effect also ensuring compliance across the, the life cycle. Uh, we also have a separate uh, environmental and social risk team, which actually is housed uh, within the risk management unit. And, and the job uh, they undertake is to do a preliminary environmental, social, and climate due diligence of the project. Uh, this just clearly ensures that all activities are environmentally and socially prudent. And in the event, <clears throat> uh, in the event we find that the risk is is high or there are certain thresholds that don't get met, we actually engage positively with the clients to, to jointly develop uh, an environment and social action plan so that there is also a, a value creation for the, uh, for the for the clients. Great, thank you. And uh, to conclude this sharing session, I would like to know if you would have a top tip that you would share with our audience today who might be starting science-based target journey? Uh, I, I, I think um, adoption of LBTI is, is uh, not only important, it's actually essential to, to measure, quantify the, uh, and assess the current and future performance. And it is extremely important to understand the true intent of setting a, a LBTI and, and, and just be transparent in, in, in the performance. Uh, the second thing I will very quickly uh, add to this is uh, I, the whole climate uh, 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 risks and ESG related risks uh, need to be communicated as, as business enablers. At the moment, this is treated as, as compliance. Uh, there is a but natural reaction of, of resisting uh, change. Uh, so it's important that uh, uh, you know, this needs to be mainstream across all the verticals uh, and functions within the bank. Uh, uh, which then in all the communications, even with the, the borrowers and stakeholders, it starts resonating as a as a value creator rather than uh, with the plan. Thank you, Niranjan, uh, for joining this session. Uh, so I guess this is a great conclusion to uh, mention that setting five space targets is not important but essential and that um, we that it needs to be integrated throughout the different verticals of the financial institutions as a business enabler. Thanks so much for sharing uh, the SBAX journey. Thank you. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, congratulations and compliments to the entire team on the great work. Um, I also wish to take this opportunity to reaffirm uh, just thanks full support and commitment towards this significant initiative. Uh, look forward to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Niranjan, um, for sharing Yes Bank's perspective there. Uh, great to have Yes Bank's participation and support. And I think it was notable that you uh, finished on the, the business case and business enabling. That's certainly um, our perspective with companies in the real economy as well, that uh, this is obviously a voluntary initiative and um, there is a strong business case for companies to set these targets to help future proof their growth, but also to um, start to navigate around uh, stranded assets and avoid some of those risks and liabilities from a financial institution perspective. So I'm just going to briefly um, describe some of the, the next steps and opportunities for financial institutions that do want to proceed with this and learn more. Um, the, uh, the period that we're in now is the pilot phase, and that started last month with our framework launch, uh, 
and it's a six month phase which will um, include our first wave of targets with financial institutions and in order to um, get more information but also provide an incentive for those first financial institutions we'll be waiving our target uh, review fee which at this point is 5,000 US dollars for the first 20 financial institutions. Um, one thing that we'll be uh, exploring during the pilot phase is how long it actually takes to uh, review and assess financial institution submissions. And it may take significantly longer than it does for companies in the real economy, in which case uh, we may have a, a higher fee. But uh, that's something that we'll determine over the next six months and uh, announce in April. Um, there are different routes to a science-based target. Um, some target-setting entities will make a public commitment, such as the 60 that Mary uh, opened with here, uh, that um, have already publicly committed to setting targets. Some will contact the initiative privately and submit a target and not announce anything publicly until the target has been reviewed and accepted by the SPT initiative, at which point it's up to the target setting entity to decide when it wants to publicly uh, disclose and communicate the target language and formulation. Um, and so the initiative is quite flexible here. Um, there are some, some deadlines though in rules. So one is uh, once uh, a financial institution or company commits to setting a target, they have two years to actually um, have that target approved by the initiative. And of course, for financial institutions, that two-year clock started last month. Uh, so two years from now. Um, there are sort of differing levels of hand-holding and attention um, that the initiative provides for target-setting entities. And uh, during this pilot phase, we expect to be providing uh, more support and attention. So uh, for for financial institutions that want that, um, we welcome you to email this uh, this address here, targets at sciencebasedtargets.org. Um, the first step is really to, to read the guidance document and especially the criteria. Uh, but then uh, the next step after that is to um, take a look at the target submission form. That's something that uh, is now available. And it's a significant uh, form of about 50 pages, uh, but it really goes through all of the details here in terms of uh, exactly what has to be included and how the financial institution is meeting each individual criteria. Um, eventually, you know, the end point of this process is uh, publishing the target on the SPT initiative website. And the financial institution is welcome to communicate about the target uh, as they wish. Um, so we're also now entering our second phase of this project, and um, these are some of the um, activities and tasks that we're considering for the second phase. So obviously the priority now is uh, the pilot uh, period and um, sort of providing a strong launch here um, and outreach and training such as this webinar that we have today. Um, We'll also be preparing revised and updated criteria and guidance that we'll publish along with the broader SPT initiative company criteria uh, in April. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, net zero targets are really taking off. And so the SPT initiative is um, actually has embarked on a rapid standard development process for net zero targets for companies. Uh, and uh, the UNAPFI Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance was mentioned earlier. Um, we are planning to scope a net zero framework for financial institutions as well um, to work in parallel with our, our net zero work and standard development uh, for companies. Uh, we're also considering additional asset class coverage, and so we're in conversation with some uh, insurance sector companies and stakeholders around uh, underwriting, um, and uh, we're considering some other possible additional asset class method development. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, you know we're very uh, aware that 
this uh, initiative is not exclusive or comprehensive. Uh, and so we do expect to have additional methods developed um, as we go. And so uh, we're developing uh, a formal review process for the additional methods to be incorporated into the SPT initiative. Naturally, our concern is to ensure consistency and um, avoiding sort of, uh, you know, um, differing levels of, uh, of ambition or the creation of loopholes. Uh, and so that's what we are um, going to be building into that review process. And then finally, uh, all of the information that um, the SPT initiative folks shared today is available on our project website. Um, and uh, so I would encourage those of you who haven't checked out the website to take a look. Uh, and if you want more information on this project going forward, um, there's a mail list that you can sign up for there that has uh, more than a thousand people on the list and um, is just an informational list. There's no commitment or public uh, affiliation with that list um, where we send updates, uh, including announcements for webinars uh, and additional resources. With that, I think I pass it back to Mary. Thank you, Thank you Nate, for, for sharing these various steps uh, and the process. I would like to just take the last couple of minutes uh, for the Q&A. I believe that actually I've looked at the Q&A section just now. Most of the questions have been directly answered by uh, Nate, Owen, and Donald. I did notice that some of you asked your questions in the chat, and I see uh, here one question in the chat on the tools. So, um, Donald, you might be able to answer this. So the question is, some of the data providers have their own ESG screening tools that uh, may be used for investment portfolios. How does the SBTI tool differ from the screening tools from the data providers apart from different data source? Um, I would say, I mean, this is, uh, the SBTI finance tool is not really a screening tool. It's a, it's a, it's a calculator, if you, if you want to be a little bit mean, uh, that calculates scores for targets primarily, and then we aggregate those targets to a company and to portfolio level. Uh, the data source uh, is essentially the same. Uh, this is data apart from the target data, which is, which is one of four data sets that you need. You obviously need your portfolio data, you need financial data, you need uh, emissions data, and you need target data. So the first three of those should already be uh, available and they should be the same as you've been using uh, uh, before. And the fourth component is the target data. So that target data is, is uh, often available to your normal um, sort of data provider as well. Um, so I'm not quite sure that, uh, I mean, this is, this is, uh, I mean, what, what we're doing here for, for companies, for example, is that we are scoring the forward-looking target that the company has set. The, car, the company has an ambition to reduce uh, their emissions by X, uh, by a, a, certain, a certain date. And we convert that into a temperature score. Um, Whilst many sort of ESG scoring solutions are weighing up a number of different uh, ESG measures and um, policies and converting those into into the score, we are solely focusing on, and that is generally quite often, more often than not, I think, uh, historic data. This is forward-looking data. This is forward-looking. What will this company actually do? I think that's the uh, that's the big difference, and that it's so laser focused on temperature, which makes it easy to um, understand, but also easy to compare to the Paris Agreement, for example. Thank you so much, Donald. So I think we're now uh, nearly uh, top of the hour.
be wrapping up, we just have one last poll question for you guys to answer. Uh, that should be flashed into the poll section of this webinar. It's uh, for us to have better feedback on if you thought this session was useful or not. Thank you so much for your answers in advance. And I would like to thank all our speakers today um, from WRI, CDP, WWF, as well as YesBank. We will be sharing all the materials discussed here through an email that you should be receiving this week, and the recording will be online as well. Thanks again for joining, and do stay in touch with us if you have any further questions or uh, elements you would like to further discuss. Thank you very much.